Today, the story of a hero saving a damsel in distress, a princess from evil, has become a very well-trodden narrative. And The Legend of Zelda is no stranger to this, being a constant theme through many of its games. In The Breath of the Wild, this is no different, with Link tasked to protect the Princess Zelda and save Hyrule from catastrophic destruction by Calamity Ganon. But the way the story unravels, the way the pieces of Hyrule's past is painted, is radically different to past Zelda games. Often becoming more linear as each game is released, Breath of the Wild echoes earlier Zelda games, providing an open world for the player set to explore, with little to almost no instruction. 100 years previously, Zelda, her knight Link, and the four champions, each piloting a divine beast, were assembled to fight the mighty Ganon. But Ganon was able to possess the divine beasts, wounding Link, and sending Hyrule into disrepair. Zelda places Link into the Shrine of Resurrection, where he heals for a hundred years. Upon awakening, Link has no memory of his past, and it's up to the player to recollect these memories, cleansing the Divine Beasts and defeating Ganon, who has now been sealed in the Hyrule Castle by Zelda, but is slowly regaining his powers. Yet the discovery of these past stories don't always seem to reveal a concrete answer. Many stories are left for players to surmise based upon loose clues, or vaguely conspire what could have happened. An iceberg chart is a way to display these conspiracies, or little known tidbits, in a tiered chart, with the easier to grasp concepts and well known facts appearing at the top of the iceberg, while the deeper down you go, the more complex and even disturbing the theories become. Today we'll be going through the Breath of the Wild iceberg just in time for the release of its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom. We'll be covering icebergs covered by Sloth's Brains and Multiversal Shark 999, as well as covering some Tears of the Kingdom theories. But don't fear if you are trying to avoid spoilers. When we're discussing Tears of the Kingdom, there'll be a spoiler warning with a timestamp to be able to skip information about the new game. And like other iceberg videos, we'll just be selecting the most interesting theory discussion ingredients from the hundreds of theories included in the iceberg charts which will be the ones that I find the most interesting. So without further ado, let's glide into the beautiful scenery of the Legend of Zelda, and take in the Breath of the Wild Iceberg. King Rome's Grave Upon awakening from his slumber, Link can explore the Great Plateau. Here, he is guided by a mysterious old man. This man later reveals himself to be King Rome. A previous king of Hyrule, Rome is the father of Zelda, but was tragically killed when Calamity Ganon awakened. Rome remained in spirit form, living a life seldom of company on top of the Great Plateau. The southern part of the Great Plateau contains a snowy expanse, peaking at the summit of Mount Hylia. If Link braves the cold and ventures to this icy peak, he will meet the old man, gazing out onto the lands of Hyrule, next to an oddly placed pile of rocks. Link can inspect this rock for an ore, but the structure does seem quite grand just to deliver one ore. Hylian Angel supposes that this rocky structure could in fact be the burial site for King Rome. Upon examining a data mine of the game, this object is named Field Object King's Tomb A01. So it seems quite possible that a king, King Rome, was buried here, but a tomb doesn't necessarily have to be where a king is buried. It could be a reference to the king's tomb in the second Zelda game, The Adventure of Link, with it acting as a landmark for a tunnel found to the south. A king's tomb being a landmark could be the very same explanation for this Mount Hylia structure. But the companion art book, Creating a Champion, does help solidify that this tomb is indeed King Rome's. When discussing Central Hyrule and the Temple of Time's surroundings, they state that King Rome's grave is here as well. They also state that it would be nice to have the Sheikah, who knew what happened, visit sometimes to offer flowers at the King's grave. But indeed we don't witness this at this rocky structure. Just Looking for Dragon does speculate that the Sheikah are visiting the Great Plateau. On the Great Plateau are Hylian trousers and boots that seem to fit Link comfortably. In the Shrine of Resurrection, Link has the old shirt which is coming apart at the seams, with the sleeves being a bit on the short side, as well as well-worn pants, which are threadbare in spots, and the legs being a bit too short. 
just looking for dragons just that after a hundred years of neglect, the fabric in these clothes were pretty much falling apart. While clothes such as the champion's tunic was being kept in good condition, as Impa was keeping it safe. The plushness of the Hylian trousers could have been because the Sheikah were replacing the clothing in the chests while travelling up to visit the tomb of their king on Mount Hylia. But it's not just Link's original clothes that have decayed on the Great Plateau. The whole land is in a state of decay. A magnificent structure during the Ocarina of Time, the Temple of Time is now in ruins. In fact, the entire Great Plateau could actually be the remains of the castle town from Ocarina of Time. Old Man Rome states that according to legend, the Great Plateau is the birthplace of the entire Kingdom of Hyrule. The Hyrule Astoria states that in order to protect the Triforce, Hyrule Castle was built in the centre of Hyrule, where the Temple of Time was located. TK James opposes that the ruins around the Temple of Time are in fact the castle town, with the Eastern Abbey potentially being the ruins of the old Hyrule Castle. Nightmare overlapped the Ocarina of Time's map with the Great Plateau, and giving some leeway for some potential tectonic shifts, they noticed how many of their structures align. Where the castle town courtyard lies is now a ruin of a fountain, with marks of what used to be a bustling market square. Heading towards Eastern Abbey is a very similar looking stone gate, yet again in ruins. And when we reach the Eastern Abbey, we are now in a location that could have been the Hyrule Castle of the Ocarina of Time era, with a dip of land where the moat could have been. Candy Cane Keyblade follows these structural comparisons to propose that Mount Hylia is in fact the royal family's tomb from Ocarina of Time. In Ocarina of Time you can see the Death Mountain behind and to the left of the Temple of Time. With Takariko Village, although not visible, being behind and to the right of the Temple of Time. In the Breath of the Wild, Mount Hylia can be found where Kakariko would have been. Keep in mind that there is already a Kakariko Village in the Breath of the Wild, located in Western Nekluda. The Kakariko's location seemed to drastically change throughout each Zelda game, so perhaps where Mount Hylia is now, a Kakariko Village could have been in the past. Candy Cane Keyblade further paints similarities by drawing us to a river that runs between the temple and Mount Hylia, reflecting the river that's in the Ocarina of Time between the castle town and Kakariko village. And you also need to travel uphill to reach the village. The royal family's tomb is located at the back of the graveyard in Kakariko village, and could have continued to be used for the burial of the royal family all the way up to Rome. But the drastic change in location of other areas such as Death Mountain doesn't make this theory that solid. A once grand road also snakes its way to the Temple of Time, but has become long flooded and left to ruin. At the end of this lake, in the Great Plateau Wall, is actually what used to be the original entrance to the Great Plateau. This entrance has been long blocked by a mass of clay, perhaps by a flood of sorts, which is why it's so difficult to access the Great Plateau come the Breath of the Wild. Troll Squad 57 used mods to remove the water behind this gate to have a more detailed look on what the entrance would have looked like, including the original gate hidden behind the mound of clay. While it could have been the natural elements that caused this gate to block off, others such as Thiku and Diamond Masters 8244 believe that these gates were purposely destroyed. Thiku believes that the Hylian army purposely destroyed the entrance in order to be able to defend the Great Plateau more easily against Calamity's army giving them a height advantage and denying their enemy simple access. Diamond Masters 8244 references Hara Warriors, Age of Calamity and how soldiers needed rescuing from the Great Plateau with rubble blocking the way. Although the Age of Calamity isn't canon, this could be used as inspiration for the real events. Now let's use our paraglider to make our way to the field's layer of the iceberg. Gliding all the way to East Nekluda, we can stumble upon the Hylian settlement of Hateno village. A quaint agricultural village, Hateno conveys a cosy environment, having been long protected by Fort Hateno. However, across a wooden bridge is one house that sticks out from the rest. Initially, Bolson along with his employees Hudson and Carson have been commissioned by the village to destroy the building. Lincoln intercept this demolition, enthusiastically choosing to buy this house, making Hateno his home. But there's a theory that Link's home has always been in Hateno. And in fact, this exact house used to be owned by Link's family. Ravafuru believes that this house was Link's home before the calamity occurred. When renovations are being done on Link's house, Carson states that the old owner apparently went off to the castle to report for service, never came back, 
never wrote, so away it goes. This could potentially fit with Link, who was a village soldier, hand plucked to protect Zelda. So perhaps upon this calling, he and his family left the Taino on quick notice, which is why the house is initially left with no furniture. Hero of Time 5 also mentions a guard who could be found in Zora's domain, who remembers Link from the past, stating that he and Link used to swim together. The Taino village is relatively close to Zora's domain, so it does strengthen the thought that this is Link's house. But Lazatron believes that Hataino is not Link's hometown. They suggest that Link wouldn't just occasionally visit Zora's domain, but would be there often. King Dorofin states that he and Link have met numerous times, with his mind overflowing with nostalgia. And another Zora, Koda, gives Link the nickname Linny. These kind of comments allude that they have a deep relationship with Link, something that would have taken many visits to strengthen. And even though Atino Village is close to Zora's domain, it is still a long trek to make regularly. Lazatron proposes that Gopunga Village is a much more appropriate village for Link to have been living in. Now in ruins, the Gopunga Village is found a lot closer to Zora's domain, but that's really the only reason for why it's proposed to be Link's hometown, so it's not that likely. Even though Hateno is further away, it's definitely much more likely. Found near Fort Hateno is Garol, who is paying his respects to the soldiers who lost their lives defending the fort in the Great Calamity. He tells Link the story of the warrior who fought at Fort Hateno. 100 years ago, there were special warriors known as champions, with the warrior at Fort Hateno being one of them, with all of them dying in the fight. But some say this one warrior went into a deep sleep to prepare to fight another day. It seems to hint that this warrior is Link, possibly being a warrior at Fort Hateno and perhaps more emphatically, creating the champion does discuss Link's family. There are no records of Link's origin, but he is not nobility. It is thought that his hometown may have been a Taino village. And during the Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity Treehouse Live, Kay Cow also mentioned Hateno Village was Link's hometown. And I love it because Link's from Hateno Village, uh, so it's a very cute glimpse into his life. K. Cow is an associate localization producer at Nintendo, and did work on the Breath of the Wild, so this statement does have some credibility. But in reality, the real owner of this Hatino house are Bolson and Carson, Chucky. who can't help themselves but squat on Link's hard-earned property. Hudson, however, has been sent to Akala to clean some land, and ends up constructing the town of Tarry. What an angel for refusing to squat at our house. Well, Sir Skills believes that he has us all fooled, and is definitely not an angel. Secretly, Hudson is a Yiga sympathizer, attempting to prevent Link from fulfilling his request to defeat Calamity Ganon. When Link first encounters Hudson at Akala, he is at the very beginning of putting his town plan into action. He sends Link all over Hyrule to find workers that can help him. A tailor, a priest, 10 bundles of wood, 20 bundles of wood, 30 bundles of wood, 50 bundles of wood, there's no way these chores are efficient. Perhaps this is a ploy by Hudson to delay Link's main questline. Hudson constructs a beautiful town, Tarrytown. This is a subtle nod to the Tarrytown village in New York, which is located on the eastern bank of the Hudson River. Boringly, Tarrytown was named upon the mispronunciation of Turvetown, Wheatstown, as the soil was light and ideal for growing wheat. In the 19th century, writer Washington Irving famously interpreted the origin of Tarrytown's name in his story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. There lies a small market town, or rural port, which by some is called Greenborough, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Tarrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days, by the good housewives of the adjacent county, from the adventurous propensity of their husbands to linger about the village town on market days. The word tarry means to stay longer than intended, to delay leaving a place, and this is what Hudson purposely intends. He wants Link to delay the defeating of evil, and get lost in the project of building a town. After the quest from the ground up is complete, Hudson cheekily asks you if you have better things to do than tarry there, perhaps very smugly due to a successful operation. Hudson is based upon the carpenters from Ocarina of Time, who are working on restoring a bridge in the Gerudo Valley. All the carpenters, except for Muta, have abandoned their post and joined the Gerudos as thieves. Hudson himself marries a Gerudo, Ronson. The Yiga clan steal from Gerudo, including the Thunder Helm, a precious heirloom passed down among the Gerudo. So perhaps this marriage is yet another ploy by the Yiga spy Hudson, 
to get closer to the Gerudo. I think this is probably a leap too far. And Hudson is still just a lovable friendly character who we help build a lovely town and life for. Maybe he's fooled me too. Yet Hudson isn't the only one thought to be affiliated with Ganon. In Patel's Link, the story of the first great calamity that happened 10,000 years before. The princess and the hero fought alongside these four champions against this ancient evil. The guardians were tasked with protecting the hero as the divine beasts unleashed a furious attack upon their terrible foe. And when the hero wielding the sword that seals the darkness delivered his final blow, the princess used her sacred power to seal away Calamity Ganon. The tapestry illustrate Impa's depiction of the sealing of Calamity Ganon. On the left is Princess Zelda. His tapestry depiction looks quite similar to how she looks in Breath of the Wild. But the hero, Link, looks remarkably different. With fiery red hair, this does not look like the Link in the Breath of the Wild. Many have drawn similarities of this tapestry to a Gerudo, with the popular theory being that this hero from 10,000 years ago is actually Ganondorf. These next couple of theories will be drawing from material from the Tears of the Kingdom trailers, so skip through to the timestamp if you want to avoid spoilers. Taking a closer look at this hero, it seems quite different to Link. This tapestry has red hair, like a Gerudo, but not like Link. And the facial hair could be similar to Ganondorf's. A golden hand could be a representation of Ganondorf's golden gauntlets that he is often perceived to be wearing. Many say that this tapestry depiction of their hero has pointed ears like Hylians, while the Gerudo have rounded ears. But come the events of Breath of the Wild, the shape of their ears have gradually changed to become pointed. With the story being that the shame the Gerudo felt over giving birth to the source of Calamity Ganon, opened up their ears to listen for messages from the goddess. This theory gained a lot of traction once the Tears of the Kingdom started releasing teasers, showing a sort of mummified Ganondorf. Also looking quite similar to the tapestry, even the sword wielded by this hero looks similar to the Golden Claymore, which is only handled by the most talented Gerudo sword fighter. But hang on, I think we might be getting a bit ahead of ourselves. In Imba's retelling, she stated that the hero wielding the sword that seals the darkness delivered his final blow. The Master Sword description states that it's the legendary sword that seals darkness. Demise is an eternal being, the source of all monsters, who conquered even time itself. When he is defeated in Skyward Sword, he has some very interesting final words. This is not the end. My hate never perishes. It is born anew in a cycle with no end. I will rise again, those like you and those who share the blood of the goddess and the spirit of the hero. They are eternally bound to this curse. An incarnation of my hatred shall ever follow your kind, dooming them to wander a blood-soaked sea of darkness for all time. Demise's curse, reincarnated in Ganon and Ganondorf, condemned them to be forever evil. With Hero of Wisdom, Hero of Courage, continuing through time as well. This hero's depiction would be out of character for Ganondorf, but this depiction could still be a male Gerudian champion. A single male Gerudo is born to the Gerudo tribe every hundred years, destined to become their king. In the Ocarina of Time their king is Ganondorf, but his way leads the Gerudo to rebel. Creating a champion states that Gerudo records that there has not been another male Gerudo since Ganondorf. And with Ganondorf potentially even being still alive, another male Gerudo is not that likely. This hero is most likely the Link of that time, with many like Aguapik believing that Tears of the Kingdom will allow us to play as that hero. Others have furthered this theory and speculated that Tears of the Kingdom, which is a continuation of the Breath of the Wild Link, actually time travels back 10,000 years to become the era's first hero. The tapestry details the use of highly advanced technology 10,000 years ago. But a member of the Sheikah tribe, Kato, says that eventually the people of Hyrule turned against this technology, 
with their creations being viewed as a threat to the kingdom. Because of this, the land of Hyrule suffered a technological decline, with many machines being long buried, until they are uncovered by King Rome. The Tears of the Kingdom trailer showcases many different vehicles, with there being much advancement compared to the Breath of the Wild. Some related this to the technological boom of the Sheikah 10,000 years ago, but this theory is certainly not popular with many. It's more likely that the Tears of the Kingdom actually takes place after Breath of the Wild. At the conclusion of the Breath of the Wild, Zelda mentions that one of the Divine Beasts, Varuta, has mysteriously shut down. So her and Link head over to Lake Hylia to investigate, and it seems logical that Tears of the Kingdom will start where Breath of the Wild left off. The more accepted theory, like the Zone Star suggests, is perhaps through the actions of the Tears of the Kingdom, things are being reset back to the beginning. The logo of the Tears of the Kingdom kind of looks like two snakes eating each other's tail. This is similar to the ancient symbol Ouroboros, which is a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. Found as far back as the 14th century BC in the tomb of Tutankhamun, the Ouroboros represents both beginning and end of time. Throughout Egypt, the Ouroboros represents the formless disorder that surrounds the orderly world, which results in the world's periodic renewal. 4th century Grammarian Cerevis notes that the snake biting its own tail represents its cyclical nature. The trailer of the Tears of the Kingdom hints at the islands of the beginning of Hyrule, Skyward Sword, with Link seemingly having a new power to reverse objects to what they once were. A very curious theory that unfortunately lacks enough evidence to be concrete. This is something that perhaps the fabled fortune teller hasn't revealed. But to examine this further, we must venture to the underground layer of the iceberg. The fortune teller prophesies that the power to oppose Calamity Ganon lies dormant beneath the ground. It's usually thought like King Rome that this power to oppose Calamity Ganon is the Sheikah technology, which ends up being taken control of by Calamity Ganon. Nintendo Black Crisis theorises that this prophecy was perhaps misunderstood, and the real power to oppose Calamity Ganon is still lying dormant beneath the ground. In the Tears of the Kingdom trailers, Link and Zelda are searching underground purposely for something. With a corpse looking like Ganondorf also appearing underground, with some sort of energy or power emitting. This led many to believe that the true power of Hyrule is lying dormant beneath the ground. And I suggest checking out Nintendo Black Crisis' video, Breath of the Wild 2, How the Prophecy Fooled Us All, which goes deeper into his theory. But I'm not entirely convinced by his theory. Perhaps the prophecy was misunderstood and the true power to oppose Calamity Ganon is actually Link, who was initially not ready to face Calamity Ganon. But once he goes into a deep sleep, lies dormant, in the Shrine of Resurrection, beneath the ground, he then becomes truly ready to be able to oppose Calamity Ganon. But who knows, maybe the prophecy has still not been met, and maybe we will reset or alter the cycle of time, reverting to the Islands of Skyward Sword. There's even evidence of the lands of Skyward Sword whispering their influence over the land of the Breath of the Wild. An ancient temple decaying in its glory. A forgotten temple masks a beautiful giant statue devoted to the goddess Hylia. A similar large statue, the statue of a goddess, broke off of Skyloft and hurtled towards the surface, landing in the sealed grounds, completing the imagery of the gracious sealed temple. The similarities in statues led many to investigate further, with Zelda Meister believing that the Forgotten Temple is in fact the long forgotten sealed temple. The sealed grounds is a spiraling pit lined with markings of a war bygone. This is where the similar statue of Goddess resides, and lays next to the sealed temple, which houses a gate of time, allowing Link to travel back in time. This sealed temple would have slowly become forgotten becoming the Forgotten Temple. Many hallways, structures, and areas of the Forgotten Temple mimic that of the Sealed Temple. Zeltic also points out similarities in a Life Tree Link plant in the Sealed Temple. The Life Tree produces legendary fruits that are said to cure any illness. Impa in Skyward Sword states that she senses great vitality in this sprout, and with any luck, it shall grow into a stout tree that will live on for a millennium. This could be a hint to the tree lasting to the present time in Skyward Sword. But Zeltic proposes this lasts much longer, 
with the tree growing out of the crumbling forgotten temple wall, still with vitality, perhaps millennia since it was planted in the sealed temple. The forgotten temple is located hidden in the crevice of the Tanakar Canyon, which is quite different to the sealed grant's original location. But creating a champion states that the design of the forgotten temple was due to the shifts in the earth crust. It made the whole area unstable, but perhaps it could have also shifted the forgotten temple from its original place, perhaps away from the center of Hyrule where the sealed temple was. With this many connections, surely the forgotten temple has to be the sealed temple, right? Well, not particularly. If we take a closer look at the similarities, it seems that the goddess statues might not be the same size, with the one in the sealed temple potentially being a bit larger. The Hyrule Historia states that it thought the Temple of Time was built directly over the ruins of the sealed temple. Maybe the cosmic tectonic plates could have led to a misnomer, but it doesn't seem too likely. Creating a champion has more developer notes about the Forgotten Temple's construction and states that it was originally meant to depict an abandonment of such an age that it had faded from people's memories, with the Tanagar Canyon originally being called the Valley of the Royal Family. And due to it representing Hyrule's ancient pasts, the designs incorporated construction elements from Skyward Sword. So it's definitely inspired by Skyward Sword, but it doesn't completely close the door to this theory, especially as the canyon that it is located at the end of was originally going to be more deeply tied to the Royal Family. An anonymous user supposed that the Forgotten Temple was actually a recreation after the original steel grounds and temple were built over by the Temple of Time in the castle town, which is why the Forgotten Temple's goddess statue appears smaller. And not to mention that the goddess statue is now inside the temple, as opposed to being outside in the sealed grounds. Narsa Sausage has another theory about the Forgotten Temple, believing that the Forgotten Temple is a reference to the Tetra Force. The Tetra Force is one of the longest running theories in the Zelda universe, with many having believed that there was a fourth piece of the Triforce instead of three. This isn't really a Breath of the Wild theory, so we'll just quickly gloss over it. On Link's Hylian shield in the Ocarina of Time, we can see the Triforce on the top of the shield, but at the bottom of the shield is a hidden fourth piece, separated from the others. In many Zelda games, four is a prominent number. The four elements and the four playable links all sharing the colour scheme of green, courage, blue for wisdom, red for power, and purple, perhaps representing the fourth piece. Nasa Sausage thinks that this fourth piece, like shown in the Hylian Shield, has attempted to be removed, erased from history. Breath of the Wild also has many patterns of four too. In the first four trials, monks created triangles with their hands, perhaps depicting the four Triforce pieces. There are four great fairies too with one great fairy, Terra, located far out in the Gerudo Desert. Almost as if exiled, like the dragon's exile close by. As the creating a champion states, not only was the Forgotten Temple inspired by elements from Skyward Sword, so were the springs of wisdom, courage, and power. All four of these places have a goddess statue, with one perhaps being cast away, long forgotten. I would say this was quite a plausible explanation, but Nintendo has seemingly tried to remove the notion of a fourth piece of a Triforce. All the Hylian shields after Ocarina of Time have not had this fourth golden triangle, while the Hyrule Historia dictates that upon leaving the world, the goddess has left behind the Triforce, three golden triangles. In truth, the only absolute we can tell about the Forgotten Temple are the ruins that have been left behind and the Forgotten Temple isn't the only monument of the long history of Hyrule. Many ruins are scattered throughout Hyrule, painting stories of long ago events. But some ruins seem to reveal more questions rather than answers. Hylian traveller Mishi loves the romantic undertones of overgrown ancient ruins, and hints at some being lost in the depths of the Faron woods. These concealed ruins at the heart of Faron grasslands are the Zonai ruins. Creating a champion, details of the history of the Zonai people have been lost to time. There are rumours that there are a savage tribe based in Faron, where the most substantial of ruins are located. But similar characteristics can be found throughout Hyrule. The disappearance of the Zonai is one of Hyrule's greatest mysteries. The Zonai are thought to be the Hyrule version of the Aztec civilization, 
the Aztecs were quite primitive in areas like their weaponry, mainly using stone and copper, which were far inferior compared to their Spanish invaders. But even with these colossal fallbacks, the Aztecs were highly advanced in other aspects. Their calendar system involved two calendars, a 260-day Tunupuali, used to track religious ceremonies and festivals, while also having the Zaya Puali, a 356-day calendar to track the solar year. They also invented new farming methods, where they artificially created farms over swampy lake beds to combat unfavourable terrain. Enrique Rodriguez Algeria, a professor in anthropology at the University of Texas, states that modern science confirmed that over 85% of the herbs Aztecs used are truly effective, emphasising the highly advanced medicine that the Aztecs had. Likewise, the Zona are thought to have been primitive in some aspects, with the barbarian helm stating that it was once worn by the warriors of an ancient warlike tribe from the Ferron region, which strongly points towards the Zonai. Yet the imagery of the Zonai, the water dragon that they were thought to have worshipped, appear in many advanced items. Now we're quickly delving back into some more Tears of the Kingdom discussion, so here's another timestamp if you wish to skip this. This imagery seems to be strengthened in the Tears of the Kingdom, with the flamethrower resembling that dragon imagery, along with a sort of hammer-like staff. And even the game's logo seems to resemble the Zonai tribe's meaningful history. A lost tribe whose murmur has been growing louder and louder. It's, it's quite, quite peculiar, peculiar that the Zona hasn't, hasn't been mentioned in any previous games. games. But perhaps this mystery has already been recorded in the past, but it has just become obscured. NYC Apologies theorizes that the Zonai tribe are in fact the interlopers from Twilight Princess. The interlopers, as described by Light Spirit Laneru, were a tribe of sorcerers who tried to establish dominion over the Sacred Realm by using the dark power of the Fused Shadow. They were eventually banished into the Twilight Realm by the Mirror of Twilight, doomed to live as mere shadows in the Twilight, with their descendants becoming the Twilight. The sudden disappearance of the Zonai tribe could align to the banishment of the Interlopers, with both of these people being advanced sorcerers, and both affiliated with a green type of magic. But the most often drawn comparison between the Zonai tribe and the Interlopers is the symbolism. Creating a champion states that the spiral pattern seems to be a unique mark of the Zonai, and it can be seen throughout the land. Variations of these spirals can be seen as far back as the Sandship in Skyward Sword, and the City of the Sky in Twilight Princess. So perhaps the influence of the Zonai has reached far throughout Hyrule. A power source in the Twilight Realm, souls are a sacred item for the Twilight. Having the power to transform corrupted beings of the Shadow Beasts back to the Twilight, Guarding these souls are Zant's hands, and these menacing enemies also contain a similar spiral pattern. And if we examine the few shadow more closely, spirals can also be found constantly through its design. But Gui Gattaz points out an inconsistency with this theory. Many of the Zonai ruins are associated with shrines, seemingly being built around them. The Thyphalo ruins contain the Shrouded Shrine. The Kazatoki Shrine can be found at the centre of the North Lamei Labyrinth. The Tukalo Shrine can be found at the centre of the Lamey Labyrinth Island, and the Dila Marg Shrine can be found at the centre of the Desert Labyrinth. These ancient shrines, serving as training grounds for the hero, were built by the Sheikah after they helped seal Calamity Ganon away, concluding the First Calamity. This means that the Zonai could have still been around by the time of the First Calamity, whereas the Interlopers would have been long banished by this time, having been banished by Twilight Princess. Ramus Kane 8684 believes that the Zonai's presence at the First Calamity could have extended to this elusive hero in a certain tapestry. The Barbarian Helm, which draws out the wearer's inner animal, is adorned with red hair, and could be an explanation for why this Link has red hair. Perhaps this inner animal, that increases strength and battle prowess, is evoking of inner courage, like the hero would suggest. Ramus Kane 8684 furthers that because Link was a Zonai, Perhaps it was the royal family of Hyrule that removed the records of the Zonai, making them mysteriously vanish, with many Zonai historical moments like Link being retold and rewritten as Hylian. An interesting theory, and I feel like more history of the Zonai will be revealed in the Tears of the Kingdom. In present day Hyrule, come the Breath of the Wild, history from Twilight Princess and the Zonai have seldom remained. 
The Lurland village hints at being the modern day descendant of the Zonai, while Garini discovers a fractured monument at the Palmore beach, which could have been made in resemblance to the Mirror of Twilight. Garini manages to decipher the text written on this monument by gathering the fragments throughout Hyrule. The deciphered text allows the opening of the Kaya Shrine, but there are some texts throughout the Breath of the Wild that are a little more difficult to decipher and to solve them. Let's drop down further into the Calamity layer of the iceberg. Found walking around the expanse of Hyrule, Beedle backpacks his wares to potential buyers. But even mighty merchants need rest, and Beedle can often be found resting at various stables, writing what seems to be very important notes into his journal. We can actually have a peek at Beedle's journal and see that it's written in Hylian. The Hylian language is used throughout Hyrule in the Zelda series, with it having gone through many variants as the game evolved. The latest version of Breath of the Wild is known as the Sixth Hylian Script, which is just a cipher that replaces each English letter with a Hylian one. And if we translate Beedle's journal, it says, Memorandum, writing, very important, document, remember, amazing. Writing, memorandum, memo, memo. As for the meaning behind this text, it's just placeholder text, as it seems every journal in the Breath of the Wild, like the author of Rumor Mill Tracings, has exactly the same text. So sorry, this point doesn't really go that deep, which means it shouldn't really be this deep down the iceberg. But let's use this point as a segue to some more obscure theories. Like us, Tracy loves investigating rumours, and in her fourth volume of the rumour mill, she discusses the treasures of the falling star. These shooting stars appear at night, crashing into Hyrule, leaving behind a star fragment. But this isn't the only celestial object that has crashed down into the lands of Hyrule. Found west of the Tabantha frontier, a massive crater can be found surrounded by other craters, also still relatively large. Known as the Giza Crater, this must have been created by a huge rock. Found at the middle of this crater is a living rock, a stone talus. So could the stone talus have created such a large hole? Hugh Speed and IEX Strides certainly think so, and they propose that the stone talus are aliens from outer space. Found in the smaller craters around the Giza Crater are stone pebbles, which are very young stone taluses. Their bodies toughen as they mature, becoming as tough as boulders by adulthood. As a child, however, their bodies are light enough to be lifted and fragile enough to break when thrown. So the stone pebbles don't seem to be made from stone, but some sort of organic material that toughens as they mature. In the Ovalite Plain is another crater, which also contains stone taluses and pebbles. So it does seem like there's a pattern with these craters and the taluses. But if the baby pebbles are fragile enough to break when thrown, there's no way that they will be able to withstand a crash landing from outer space onto Hyrule. Anonymous Fellow 8879 suggests that the craters could have been created by Talus eggs, with the mature taluses then using the craters as a nesting ground, while the taluses migrated throughout Hyrule, adapting to their own environments. There are variants of the stone talus titled Senior and Junior. In the Japanese version, these are titled Ani, meaning big brother, and Ototo, meaning little brother. This could imply that there's some sort of family, generations between the talus. But the talus don't necessarily have to be from outer space. Fire describes Demise as the source of all monsters, and creating a champion explains the phenomenon of the Night of the Red Moon, where monsters are granted new life through Ganon's malice. The stone talus are also resurrected during the Blood Moon, which does imply that they originated from Hyrule. But then again, treasures and weapons are replenished through a blood moon too. So are they monsters? Another common theory is that Talus originated from Death Mountain. Igneo Talus, naturally camouflaged as molten rock, can be found throughout Death Mountain. And perhaps during an eruption of Death Mountain, the Talus was sent far across Hyrule, dispersing and adapting to their environments. It seems that they have been resting all around Hyrule. With Choco Bro pointing out the Talus battle song incorporates the sounds of picks hitting rocks, as if the miners of Hyrule stumble across these abhorrent monsters. The Breath of the Wild songs were brilliantly composed by Sashi Abe, Manaka Katalka, and Yasaka Iwata, and designed by Hajime Wakai. All of the tracks were made with love and specific intent. Wakai made a rule that they shouldn't rely on cheap techniques of reusing music from older games for easy fan service points, so they often tried to hide old songs and hidden meanings in their pieces. 
For example, the song The Last King of Hyrule begins with a piece fit for the last king, Rome. And its theme is actually a sped up jingle that plays with the mysterious old man. Subtly linking that this old man is King Rome. And the latter half of the last king of Hyrule references Farewell Hyrule King from Wind Waker. Even the house theme in Breath of the Wild is just a broken, slowed down version of the one from Ocarina of Time. Upon the Japanese soundtrack release of the Breath of the Wild, a booklet was included containing an interview with those involved with the game music. In it, Wakai mentioned that no one had yet realised the one in Kakariko Village, with puzzle solvers needing to listen to the glockenspiel in the song very carefully. This glockenspiel is hard to make out when listening without any filters, but Jedi Wizard 7 pointed out that you can hear, hidden away, the Kakariko Village theme from the Ocarina of Time. It can be very hard to hear, but if you follow the visual editing magic I've added, you might be able to hear some similarities. It's fun to have all this nostalgia hidden in the background of the ambience, but it's not always just a blissful trip to the past that the songs provide. Some songs paint a more painful, dark past. Built the seal calamity gun in a way, the divine beasts are giant mechanical animals, each piloted by a champion from across the land. But upon the second great calamity, Ganon was now aware of the power of the divine beasts, and through the malice of Blight Ganon, gained control of the divine beasts, tragically killing their pilots. Link is spurred to free the divine beasts, and while doing so, each divine beast plays a unique soundtrack. And Tack Floyd noticed something quite strange about each of these songs. Each Divine Beast theme had a series of beeps hidden as an anxious undertone. A lot of these beeps can be recognised as Morse code, with each song sending SOS signals throughout. One thought is that these SOS signals are broadcast by the somewhat semi-sentient machines, who were signalling their enslavement by Ganon with a cry for help. For Hearth and Home I actually proposed that the SOS signals were sent by the champions. These divine beasts situated throughout the far expanse of Hyrule, very far apart, so maybe the champions were able to commute to each other through Morse code. Each divine beast soundtrack has their SOS signal appearing at a different time. The divine beast Varudania, operated by Goron champion Daru, has an SOS signal transmitting instantly in their song. The divine beast Varuta, operated by Zora champion Mifa, has an SOS signal transmitting at the start of their song too. And so does Divine Beast Varnaboros, which is operated by Gerudo Chipabosa. But the Divine Beast Varmado, operated by the Rito champion Rivali, only has an SOS signal beginning transmitting 16 seconds into their song. Rivali is seen to be quite arrogant and boastful, stating that he's only lost to win by Ganon because he was winging it. Another Rito Kars mentions that Rivali was not one to share his feelings. Perhaps this arrogance led to the refusal to ask for help, which is why Rivali's Divine Beast song has a delayed SOS signal. But there's not just SOS signals that are appearing within these songs. Tones Balones identified beeps appearing adjacent to the SOS with perhaps there being another hidden code in the song. Along with RC Vida, who examined the audio spikes in the song, and Dragon Aichu, who could translate the Japanese signals. These signals could be sending the message Utusmu, which means inward. Perhaps the champions, or the divine beast themselves, are calling for help, while informing those that hear their distress, the enemy sinking their ship is inward, within, as the Divine Beasts themselves have been taken over by Calamity Ganon. 
a truly deep message hidden within music of all things, but I wouldn't put it past the terrifically devious composers. That brings us to the end of our exploration of the dilapidated Hyrule of the Breath of the Wild. And with Link and Zelda restoring Hyrule to its former glory, along with the inevitable conflicts brought about with the Tears of the Kingdom, I cannot wait to see what chapters will be finished, and what stories will begin in the Tears of the Kingdom. Thanks for making it all the way through this video. And if you want to delve deeper into Zelda lore, I suggest YouTubers such as Zeltic and Nintendo Black Crisis who have insane libraries of Zelda exploration and theories. What do you think about all of these theories that we've discussed? Or perhaps there are some theories that we've left out. Bring them up in the comments. Let's be off and keep theorizing until we are beckoned again.